All right, hello again, Ling statisticians. Uh, today we are going to talk about variance and standard deviation, building off a couple of the concepts we've been working on already. Uh, so uh, I noticed last time I kind of went uh, a little longer than I really would hope to. Uh, so I'm bringing the I'm bringing the clock back. It says 4:49. It's uh, Saturday, June 19th, 2021. We'll see how long this goes. I don't think it should take that long, but this is an important concept, so I don't want to like just skim over it too much. Uh, and before I get to variance and standard deviation themselves, I wanted to go back a little bit to what we talked about at the end of the last lecture on outliers. Uh, we were talking about this event, um, this marathon event, uh, where Eliud Kipchoge um, ran a marathon length distance in under two hours, but he... Uh, benefited from a lot of help. They basically structured the entire event to see if he could do it in under two hours. So it wasn't like a typical marathon. Uh, and for that reason, that time is not considered an actual record for the event uh, in any way and for the marathon itself, um, that is. And so we looked at sort of how his time compared to the time you might get, um, the time distribution you might get for a normal marathon, like the Boston Marathon, which as I mentioned last time, is not the kind of marathon that you'd expect people to set records in anyways, because it's hillier than um, other courses and difficult for a variety of reasons. But he, if you look at his time, it obviously stands out from the whole distribution. Like there are a few like um, excellent runners at the far end, far right end here who are doing obviously much better than everybody else, but he's even doing much better than they are with a bit of a gap in between them about 10 minutes, which is considerable in the marathon, even for a distance of that length. Uh, but because, he set that time. He was able to achieve that time um, under different conditions than a marathon would normally be run. It's not going to be considered a record. It's just an amazing achievement. Um, and then the other part of this is that I wanted you to say, just notice this is what an outlier looks like in real life. It's not linguistics, right? But it's obviously a data point that's like sticking out as maybe different for some reason. Um, but you don't know just on the basis of it sticking out whether or not it's a legitimate data point or not. So the other um, example I gave you just kind of on the fly was Wayne Gretzky. <clears throat> and I wanted to go back to Wayne Gretzky's career records, or at least one of them, um, because uh, when I first taught this class, actually my wife was in the class and she's like, I had no idea what you're talking about half the time uh, because I talk about culturally specific things like you might find in Canada that you wouldn't find anywhere else, uh, like hockey. So I want to just walk you through the basics so you're not totally confused about what's going on in case you don't follow hockey, which is probably likely if you're a linguistic student, but who knows? Uh, anyways, um, the primary offense, to, so hockey is a game like soccer, which is more widely played around the world. It's basically the same idea. You're trying to put an object in a goal and it's a team sport, but hockey is on ice and they play it with skates and sticks and the ball is flat. Uh, that's basically it. Um, and then the, if you do score a goal in hockey, um, there's one player who scores a goal and maybe one or two players who get credit for passing the, the puck to the player who scored the goal and they get an assist. Uh, and if you get either one of those, it's called a point for statistical purposes. And Wayne Gretzky was by far the best point scorer in the history of professional hockey. Nobody else was even close. So I dug up some data on this um, from a uh, website called quanthockey.com, which made it easily available and uh, manipulable for purposes like these. Uh, and I was only able, though, to get the top 1,000 players in the history of hockey. And this is what their points distribution looks like. So it goes down to about... 400 um, points in a career, uh, all the way up to Wayne Gretzky, who's this ridiculous little dot here over on the right-hand side of this graph. So this is all the best players in the history of hockey, and then Wayne Gretzky about a 1,000 points higher than the rest of them. Um, so this is an outlier uh, in a similar sense to the way Elliot Kipchoge, Kipchoge's record time was an outlier. But it turns out this is a legitimate record because – um, Wayne Gretzky was able to accomplish this feat under the same playing conditions as everybody else on this chart. Uh, so, right, the moral of this story is you can spot out outliers, like in R, when it plots a box plot, it's saying, oh, wow, look at these this number of P's in this P pod. It's way beyond like what you expect from just the interquartile range or what have you. So it's going to plot it with just a point in the uh, box plot. So it's going to say this is kind of an outlier. 
but you don't know whether or not it's legitimate or not um, until you figure out like, well, how did we sort of collect this data? Does it represent something different from the rest of the data in the distribution? And in fact, if we go back to the PPOD data, um, that those like extreme valued PPODs with like nine uh, P's in them or four P's in them that my wife collected, uh, those were legitimate PPODs. <laughs> those are, that's real data. Uh, they're just sort of on the extreme edges of the, the distribution, so they can look like outliers, but you shouldn't toss that data just because they're on the edges. You can say toss the LU Kipchoge record from the rest of like the marathons run in the world because it wasn't run under the same conditions, but you don't know that just by looking at this on the surface is the point. Um, people or data points can stick out for a variety of reasons. If they're representing different reasons than the ones you were trying to figure out or collect in your experiment, then you can toss them out. Like if somebody's not trying in an experiment at all or something like that, then you can toss that data out. But if it's just a really exceptional data point for whatever reason or a really exceptional sort of participant, then uh, you kind of need to keep it because they represent part of you know your sample um, in a legitimate way that you're trying to analyze. Uh, so I'm going to, I've said enough about this already. We're already at 4.55, so I'm going to move on. But that's kind of the, the moral of the story. Plus, I kind of like this graph that showed you a little better how exceptional Wayne Gretzky's record was rather than me just reading numbers out of a book. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to pause for a second and talk about measures of spread. So <clears throat> a couple of lectures ago, we walked through two basic measures of spread. Uh, one was range, which is very simple. It's just the minimum and the maximum values in a distribution. Uh, and then we talked about the interquartile range. And I'm not going to talk about how to calculate that again. Hopefully that it got across. But if it didn't, you can always go back and rewatch those videos. But the interquartile range is kind of the one that um, is a little bit more representative of the sort of variation within the distribution itself. What we're going to look at today um, are measures of spread, which get more detailed even than the interquartile range about what's inside the distribution. So the first of these is called the variance, which uh, you will often see represented um, as S squared. And then there's also standard deviation, which is represented as S. Um, so the names themselves you might have heard of before, variance and standard deviation, um, and they don't make it clear that there's some relationship between them. But when, we, when you look at these um, variables that represent these two different values, it does show you that there is a relationship between them, such that variance is actually standard deviation squared. So standard deviation just S, variance is S squared. Uh, but I haven't told you yet how we're going to calculate these. Um, we'll get into that in a second. And kind of the conceptual point I want to get across first is that number one, um, these measures are going to be more complicated than calculating a range. Uh, and they're still going to be relatively intuitive to figure out conceptually. Uh, and the way that kind of the conceptual part that really matters is that it, these measures are going to take every value in a distribution into consideration when calculating how much spread there is in that distribution. Um, I kind of got ahead of myself here a little bit, so I think I'm going to um, reiterate that point here at the beginning of the next slide. But So variance is an attempt to quantify how much variability there is in a distribution by taking into account all of the different vari values of a variable. So it's not going to just look at, say, these extreme measurements like the minimum or maximum. It's not going to look at some central measure of tendency alone or the quartiles or whatever. Instead, everything in the distribution is going to factor in to some extent. Um, so that's nice because it's more comprehensive than these other measures of uh, spread or range that we've been talking about so far. Um, so here's the equation for it. Like I said, it's a little complicated, but you should be able to wrap your head around it without too much difficulty. And if you can't see it right away, I'm going to walk you through it step by step. So that hopefully we're all on the same page by the time we get through this. Uh, but S squared is just variance on the left-hand side of this equation. And then over here on the right-hand side of the equation, we've got a fraction. Uh, so this top part uh, gives us this summation symbol again, where I goes from 1 to N. And then we've got um, this term in parentheses here, X sub I minus the mean of X. And that term gets squared. And then you sum up all those squares. You divide all that by N minus 1. And N, again, is just the number of values in the distribution uh, or the sample for that particular variable X. 
Um, so I'm going to walk you through that step by step. I'm going to repeat or just reshow the uh, equation here at the top of this slide. So in the numerator or the top half of the fraction, we've got this summation notation, which basically indicates that the equation is going to cycle through all the values of the variable x, right? Um, yeah, I'll show you some examples as we go through this eventually. We can think of this as like every single value for a p pod out of the 12 that we've been talking about um, a lot up until now. And what's being summed up here, though, we've seen this summation notation uh, before. I talked about that explicitly. And I'm sorry about this little gap in the uh, parentheses. I couldn't fix the formatting in PowerPoint to get rid of it. But anyways, uh, what's being summed up, what should fit into that gap is um, basically it starts out with this difference measure. So it's x sub i minus the mean of x. So x sub i just means I'm picking one particular value of x, like say, seven p's and pod for you know the third p pod that i picked or something like that and i look at the difference between that and the mean value of all the p pods that i selected uh, in my sample all right so we're just looking at the difference between those two so if i can't remember the specific values for the mean i think svitlana's mean p pod average was seven point seven and a third seven point three 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 so on and so forth so this if if x sub i was seven and you subtract uh, 7.333 from that, you wind up with a negative third out of that, right? So that would be the difference between the two. And if it was eight minus seven and a third, you wind up with positive two thirds, right? Something like that. Uh, okay, so you may have already figured out what's going on here, but just to make it explicit, uh, we're looking at how different each data point is from the mean of the variable X. Um, but that's a little bit problematic because uh, in those two examples I just came up with, up with on the fly. Um, one was negative, one was positive, and we're gonna sum up all of these differences somehow. So alone, if I just took like the summation of all these differences out of like all the different values of the variable and the distribution, um, and then sum them up, in a sense that could tell you how much variance there is in the sample, but the overall equation is gonna take two steps to make the measure more meaningful. So the first step it will take is dealing with that maybe it's going to be negative, maybe it's going to be a positive difference issue. So each difference, when we calculate variance uh, between a single value of that variable and its mean, is going to be squared. Uh, so what this does is that it's not only going to square the difference values, which will make them larger, but it's going to make them all positive as well. Well, I guess it won't necessarily make them all larger, but it's going to square them regardless. And it's definitely going to make them all positive. So that when you add up all of those square differences, all of them will count positively towards the overall sum. So, you know, think of it maybe like I, haven't, I should have made a graphic, but you think of this as like my mean value of whatever, uh, that I'm going to have little dots above and below the, the horizontal line, right? Above my hand. Uh, and I'm just kind of want to get a sense of like, on average, how big are those differences between the individual dot and where that line is? Um, you know, so if they're really big like this on average, then I'm gonna get a lot of variance. Uh, and if they're relatively close like this, maybe sometimes above, sometimes below, then I'm gonna get a small amount of variance. Okay, it would have been nicer with a graph. I'm sorry, maybe I'll put that together before the next lecture. Uh, here's how the math works though. So let's say we had, uh, or we have a very small subset of just three students in our class who speak one, two, and six languages each. So we just have three students in class, and this is the number of languages each one of them speaks. Um, one, two, and six is our sample. So the mean number of languages spoken by these students is going to be three. So if you do the math, hopefully you can do this in your head, and if you can't, just write it out. It doesn't matter. Uh, one plus two plus six is, well, one plus two is three, and three plus six is three. Or, sorry. Three plus six is nine. Jumping ahead of myself. So nine divided by three is three. Maybe I should use a piece of paper, but it's okay. I've already done this ahead of time. The mean number of languages is just going to be three. Uh, so I'm going to, I'll put together a table here that shows how the differences between these values and the mean compares to the square differences between these values and the mean. So you get a sense of what that step does for you. Um, here we go. We have one student who speaks one language. The overall mean for the group is three. So X sub I is just one. The mean X bar is three. X sub I minus X bar is negative two. And then when I square that, I get a value of four. So um, in this case, you'll make the magnitude of this value X sub I minus X bar 
bigger if I square it, goes from negative two to four, and it also makes it positive, right? Um, the second student only speaks or speaks two languages with no small feat. I don't want to discount it too much. So uh, we'll just, it doesn't matter either for the math. So two minus three is negative one. Square that, you get one. Um, and again, that's a case where like, you know, it's going to be, if I have just one language, I'm further below the mean than I, if I have like two languages, I'm getting a little bit closer to the mean. So there's less sort of deviation there. Um, but anyways, the uh, square difference is one. And then we have this one student speaks six. Uh, so six minus three is three and three squared is nine. So overall, these are my squared um, differences uh, between the individual values of the variable and the mean four, one and nine. Uh, so if I add all those up together, I get a total of 14. But if I go back to this term, which is unsquared, as it were, just X sub I minus X bar, uh, then uh, it turns out they're all going to cancel each other out. So negative two plus negative one plus three is zero. Um, and that's just oh, how the calculation of the mean works out. Uh, it's not just that I'm, you know, not getting, uh, you know, accurate picture of how much variance there is because there's some um, kind of canceling each other out in those cases. It's like they completely cancel each other out. So I don't want to use this at all, even though it's like intuitive to think, oh, I just want to look at like the difference or the distance between the individual variable, variable points and the mean. Um, I got to square it to get something meaningful out of this information. Um, something overall positive, which tells me how much variance there is in the, the distribution. And in this particular case, we get this number 14, which is not super meaningful on its own. We got to kind of normalize it, as we say, to get a sense of like how much that variance is in uh, the grand scheme of things. Um, so that leads us to what's going on on the bottom of this fraction, which is this n minus one term. Uh, so the numerator and the variance is going to provide me or us a measure of the square total of variation between the individual sample values and the sample mean. Um, and then what's going on on the bottom is we divide that by the number of items in the sample minus one. So if we go back to my terrible graphic, um, you know, if this is three, my hand here, and I've got one, I've got two, and I've got like six, what I kind of ultimately want to get is a sense of sort of like the average distance between these individual points and the uh, the hand, basically, right? Uh, and I'm getting this number on the top of the fraction, which just says 14, and it's hard to know exactly what that means. And one way I can think of that is like, well, if I divided it by like all the different differences I'm looking at, then I can get a sense of like what the average uh, distance is. But I don't actually wind up doing that because instead of dividing by three in that case, I have three points and you might want me to divide the sum by of 14 by three. Uh, instead, I'm gonna divide by two. I'm gonna divide by N, which is three minus one. Okay, so why do we do that? We're kind of getting an average amount of variation when we do this, we calculate this fraction, but we're dividing by N minus one rather than N. Um, that's weird. I'm gonna let you think about it for a second because normally I'd ask this question in class and wait for people to come up with an answer. Uh, instead, I'm just gonna take a little bit of a drink and say that we're already at 507. So hopefully this won't last too much longer, but we gotta do what we gotta do. And I'm now gonna give you the answer, um, which maybe you figured out by now. Uh, if you haven't though, don't worry because it's kind of a weird way to think about things uh, and it's not immediately obvious. So the reason we divide by N minus one is that only n minus one of the items in the sample can have their values vary freely. Okay, why is that the case? Um, and it depends on sort of what we're throwing into that equation. Uh, so I'll give you an example here, which might make it more understandable. Uh, we're gonna look at a similar sample scenario as the one above, but we're just gonna have a sample of three items. Um, and let's say, we know that the mean of the sample is four. Like when we're calculating, you know, that difference measure x sub i minus x bar, we need to know what the mean is in order to do that. So in this case, our sample has a mean of four and we've got three items in the sample and the first two items in the sample are two and three. Can you, on the basis of this, tell me what the value of the third item is? And I'm not thirsty right now, but I'm still gonna take a drink of water because I want you to think about this. All right, you figured that one out yet? Um, you can do it using basic algebra. 
Another way to ask this question is to solve for the question mark in the equation below. Normally, instead of a question mark, we'd have you know a variable like x or y, but we've seen enough of those by now. I just want to focus on the fact that I want you to solve for the value of this guy. Um, so basically what this is saying is we know the mean is four, and we know that the way to calculate the mean is to add up all of the individual values of the variable and then divide it by the number of values of the variable that we've got. So two plus three plus whatever this is, divided by three should equal four. And if you crunch through the numbers there, you should be able to figure out that that third item, that question mark has to equal seven. Um, yeah, if you're really curious, I could walk you through the math. Um, yeah, it's like if you multiply both sides of this by three, you get two plus three plus question mark equals three times four, which is 12. And then if you do subtract two plus three from both sides, you get question mark equals 12 minus two plus three, which is seven. Um, yeah, so that's the basics how that works. But the more important point is that we only know, we only have to know two of the sample values to fig and the mean to figure out what the third sample value is. I mean, there's another sense you can think about this. Like if I know all the three sample values, then I automatically know what the mean is, so on and so forth. There's only three values out of these four that are going to actually be able to vary freely from one another. Once I know three of them, then I will know what the fourth is. And I can know what the three individual values might be, then I can figure out what the mean is, or I can know two of the individual values in the mean, and then figure out what the third individual item value is in the sample as well. Um, so there are only that many degrees of freedom in the sample. It turns out there's only gonna be N minus one, as long as I'm using that mean to calculate the overall equation. So yeah. If I know x bar and I know n minus one values for x sub i, that number, then I know what the final value of x sub i is going to be. So this concept is called degrees of freedom. Um, basically, to reiterate what I was saying again, the value of the third item in our little example cannot vary freely with respect to all the other values along with the mean. So all the variation is captured by just n minus one items in the sample, which is why you don't factor that last part in when we're dividing by this number to kind of calculate average variance overall. So n minus one is what we divide the sum of squares by. That term on the top, I'm gonna to call the sum of squares uh, in order to determine the average value of variance for all of the items in the sample. Um, and I'm putting average in quote here because I think it kind of helps you understand what we're trying to accomplish with this equation, but don't take it seriously as an actual average or of any sort or a mean of that sort. And one of the reasons why is because we're dividing by something different than you would normally divide by when calculating calculating the mean or you know the average central tendency measure. Um, so this n minus one term um, is known as the degrees of freedom in the sample. And n minus one is the number of degrees of freedom in this particular example. We'll see other values of degrees of freedom in other examples as we go. Uh, but in this particular case, just keep in mind degrees of freedom is defined by this statement here, the number of values in the final calculation of a statistic that are free to vary. Uh, so I'll just reiterate that again, because this is a concept that's not immediately intuitive for a lot of students, but basically the degrees of freedom is the number of values in the final calculation of a statistic that are free to vary. Um, and in this case, it's N minus one. Okay. Um, overall though, um, if I go back, I use this term sum of squares here. I didn't highlight it, but I'm going to come back to it. Um, if we go back to our variance equation, wherever it is, yeah. Um, this top part, I'm going to call sum of squares because we have a square factor here and we have a sum factor here. So it's sum of squares. Variance is going to be equal to the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. Just try to keep that in mind. It'll help you. It's a good rule of thumb for remembering what it is, especially as we go through the concepts um, throughout the rest of the semester in this class. Okay, so covered that a little bit. Last thing we need to talk about is standard deviation. So a couple slides ago, uh, well, no, in the previous slide, I said the dividing by the sum of squares, dividing the sum of squares by the degrees of freedom in a sample gives you a sense of an average variance for each item in the sample, even though it's not really the average, but that's kind of what we're shooting for. Um, but remember uh, that these average values actually represent the average squared differences between the sample values and the mean of the sample. 
Uh, and so if you want to kind of really get a sense of the average, um, you'd have to unsquare that squaring, uh, which is exactly what the standard deviation does. So um, if you kind of think again to this terrible hand example, like we got one, two and six languages and then an average of three, um, sort of the distance between the individual um, values of the variable and the mean, you can think of as like the deviation. Uh, for each particular item and standard deviation is kind of like average deviation sort of right That's where that notion of standard comes into play So the standard deviation is going to be the square root of the variance and this square root is basically kind of undoing this squared factor inside um, the radical here, right? Uh, so we can't not take that step of squaring those differences because we need to get a positive variance value overall. We have to do it sort of after the fact. Uh, and it winds up being maybe a little bit different than you'd expect. So I wanna give you um, a few examples of how this works. <clears throat> so if you go back to our example of this uh, subset of three students who speak one, two, and six languages each, we can calculate the sum of squares as below. We've seen this before. Like if we weren't gonna square things, we just get a sum of zero, which is not helpful to us. But if we do square those differences, then we get a sum of squares of 14, which seems to mean something. But we said like, it's kind of an arbitrary number. What, how can we sort of put that into perspective? Uh, well, one way is to look at the variance, which divides that sum of squares by the degrees of freedom. So the number of degrees of freedom we have is three minus one. We only have three items in our sample. We subtract one because we know what the mean is. Uh, and we get 14 divided by two, which is seven. So three minus one is two. So divide 14 divided by two, we get seven. And then if we want to go to the extra mile and figure out the standard deviation, we just take the square root of that variance number. Um, so square root of seven is 2.65. And maybe you can think of it again, like I've got my mean of three and one, two and six. This is kind of saying like the average deviation here is gonna be about 2.65, um, sort of not quite, but that's kind of what we're trying to get at with these um, basically uh, dispersion measures. Um, yeah, or spread measures, I guess is the way I started this out. I'll give you a few more examples to hopefully make this a little bit more intuitive. So let's say we create a vector in R. I'm gonna do this in a second. Um, and maybe, yeah, maybe I'll just do it in R so you don't see the answers here. Um, so I'm gonna start out by creating a vector in R with a series of six fives. Uh, and the way you do it, that is with this code. And I'll just do it in R here and hopefully you didn't see that. <laughs> because I have the answers uh, to what I'm going to do here in a second uh, on that slide. Um, so we'll just do it without it. Uh, maybe I'll do it this way too. So I'll do do sample zero. Uh, so one, two, and six. This is the one we just did the math for. Uh, just to show you how this works. So the, um, the command to create um, like an individual vector of values is this. We've seen that before. So we're just saying we've got three students who speak this number of languages each. Um, in our um, variable called sample zero or a vector called sample zero. If I want to figure out what the variance of that is, I just say VAR and put sample zero in parentheses and it tells me seven. Uh, and the co um, code for standard deviation is just SD. Uh, and that gives me about 2.65 um, for the standard deviation of the same guy, which by the way is the square root of seven. Um, same thing. <laughs> so you can do basic math in R2. I'm just not going to do a whole lot of it because we got so much else to learn, but it's it's powerful. It can do whatever you want, basically, as far as math and stats is concerned and graphics too. Um, we're only gonna see a small part of it, but let me uh, take a look or show you uh, what we get when we have say six fives in a row, right? So let's pretend we have six students, all of them speak five languages. Uh, what do you think the variance is gonna be for this? I guess before we get into that, we get to say, well, what's the mean? And that should be pretty straightforward to calculate it's five. The variance is gonna be zero, right? Um, it's not varying at all from that mean. So it's dot, 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 right, right all in the mean. So I'm not getting any sort of deviation there. Uh, we could try it a different way and say, well, what if I do have this varying a little bit on both sides? So four and six, um, that's still gonna give me a mean of five, right? Uh, but I will have some variance in there. So on average, um, those are gonna deviate by one from the mean. Um, but when I calculate the actual variance there, it's not gonna wind up being one. It's gonna be a bit bigger than one because 
Uh, I'm not dividing that sort of summed up deviation by the number of items in the sample. Uh, I'm going to divide by n minus one, right? So maybe you can think about this a little bit, right? So four minus five is negative one squared, you get one. Six minus five is one squared, you get another one. Um, each one, if you add them all up, it's one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one. You get six ones. So you have six um, sort of deviations there, deviation units on the top of that fraction. And if you divide it by n minus one, which is six minus one, you divide six, divide by five. Uh, sorry, six over five is the fraction that I'm looking at. That's 1.2. Um, so it's almost one, which is kind of what you might expect, but not quite. Uh, if we take the standard deviation and sort of unsquare our squarings, uh, we get something closer to one, uh, but still not quite. And then lastly, I'll show you what it looks like um, if we push that deviation even further. So on average, we'd expect something like two here. We'd still get the same mean or average value at five. Um, but the variation, uh, maybe pause and think about it for a second. Like what could I expect my variance to be here? I'm not gonna walk you through all the specifics of the math because R can do it for us so easily. But if you want to, you know, write it out by hand and try to figure out what it would be or use an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. Um, so on average, each of these points is deviating from the mean by two, whether it's positive or negative. So I take my variance of that, it's actually gonna wind up being something like four uh, with a little bit of boost because we're dividing by n minus one rather than n. Uh, and if I go back to the standard deviation there, I get something close to two, but it's bigger than that again for the same reason. Um, but that's kind of what standard deviation is measuring is like how far are each of these points from the mean on average for my distribution. Um, and variance is gonna be the square of standard deviation. Um, yeah, and both of these sort of concepts or quantities will come up in like future concepts that we're gonna build on to start doing things like hypothesis testing in, um, in statistics and R in particular. Uh, and also we're gonna look at the standard deviation next time when we calculate something called Z scores or Z scores, if you're more Canadian about it. Um, so that becomes important as well. I'm not gonna spill the beans yet about that though. I'm just gonna say 521. I think this is like a 30 something minute lecture, hopefully not too bad. Um, and hopefully these concepts are pretty clear by this point. So I'm gonna stop. Um, next lecture I'm gonna make is on R commands though, and then we're gonna get into Z scores after. So there's still a lot to learn and I'm looking forward to learning it all again with you. See you then.